Okay, hi everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, kind of had a rough week last week with some surgery and stuff, so I didn't really, um, uh, wasn't able to take a lot of time to, to organize this, and so it may be a little skeltered, uh, but I found that, you know, after 50 years or so of uh, attending these types of seminars, you learn a lot more if it's just very informal and uh, everybody gets in and starts uh, uh, contributing, then, then that, that's when you really learn a lot. So um, in order for it to flow, I think uh, you, I'm going to need questions from you guys. So um, <clears throat> the other thing is uh, Aaron announced this, uh, this was about electronic components, and I think he got a little bit of pushback because um, a lot of you guys say, I'm never going to be a repair technician. What do I need to know about electronic components? But it's the easiest way to express to you how some things work. And there aren't very many. All we're going to talk about today are capacitors, coils, and resistors. And they all have a, a function and uh, I'll be demonstrating a little bit to you about the effects of, of all of them and where they're used and so on and so forth. So anybody have anything before we get started? Okay. So I have a roll of wire here that I got when I was in high school. It's very thin, I think it's uh, 30 gauge, something of that nature. And um, if you take, uh, take this wire and you put, you were to measure it from one end to the other, all you'd get is a short because that's all it is, is a piece of wire. Um, that is as long as it's not on the roll, if it's a straight piece of wire. Um, not much can influence it uh, from the outside. There is some things, if the wire is long enough, that can influence it. Um, we're going to get to why, why you don't want to run a mic line and a power line together uh, because of uh, these types of things. But in, in a straight piece of wire, it's hard to do anything to it. If you set, take the same piece of wire, So I took a, I took about 10 feet of the wire and I made a coil. Uh, I'd used one of Jed's medicine bottles and just wrapped it around there, but um, you can, is, as long as it's a coil, then uh, you can kind of get the idea of what's happening with it. But, I've got this hooked to the oscilloscope, which I need to bring up here. Get that as quiet as I can. Um, the, the voltages that we're dealing with are so low that the oscilloscope kind of goes crazy a little bit with the noise in the air. But this is that coil. And if you think this piece of wire can't, cannot generate electricity, I'm going to take this magnet right here and move it in close proximity to the coil. You see what's happening there? Now, if, if I were to hook the coil to a diaphragm, say, and the diaphragm would vibrate with the sound waves from my mouth, um, then the coil would move. And if you put the magnet as a permanent magnet, the coil would move within the magnet. And all of a sudden, what you have is a microphone, uh, a dynamic microphone. We have one here. Uh, 
And I don't know if you can see it, um, but this, there's this thin, thin diaphragm, and then you can see the coil around that that is wound that's similar to this one. It, this is sitting inside of a magnet, and the magnet uh, provides the between the coil and the magnets where the electricity is generated. So this is what we call elect, uh, sound uh, voltage producing device. In a few minutes we'll talk about one that's a voltage modifying device. So you use these every day. This is a SM what head, Aaron? Like an SM58 head. Yeah. Um, these are dynamic microphones. People like them because they're uh, very rugged and they don't require phantom power. And so uh, that's the premise of how a, how a dynamic mic works. Now, <clears throat> coils are used for um, many other things as well. Uh, for instance, here's a This is a crossover coil. I actually just took pictures of these yesterday. So um, that's this, and this is a coil that deals, that you have inside your crossover. Now coils um, are what have a, a property about them that they call inductive reactants. And so I've got a little demo here for you to, to show you what they do to frequency when you, so what I've got here is a, I've just got an amplifier and speaker. Not too bad. Um, what I've done is just broken one of the lines and I'm going to put it, put the coil in series with it. So here's the original. Here's through the coil. What happened? You what? Yeah, it's passing low frequency. And it's not passing high frequency. So this is the make of a, this is the start of a, of a crossover. What they are is, um, and I'll show you how these are put on paper. Um, so a coil, uh, just a minute here. These are the two leads that you hook up. Um, and in a schematic, it's represented like this. So if you ever see on a schematic, uh, this, this kind of a symbol here, that's a coil. And so th those are two uses of uh, coils so far. Um, but they come in all different types of things, uh, and they come in different values. Like this coil here is a 0.9 millihenry, and I've got one here that's a little bit bigger. You can, if you're using them for crossovers, you've got to have, make sure that you use using big enough wire to deal with the power that you're putting in, yes. So the first we use is the smaller one out of the micro, the, essentially the microphone is going like this. Why is that one? Okay, thanks. Thanks for asking. Okay, so if, if we have this little deal here, it, it has, you know, you, you saw since you were a kid, if you, if you have a magnet, 
it has these lines of force around it, right? And so it's radiating out a force. And what happens is when you introduce this coil and run it in and out of those lines of force, that's what's producing the voltage. So the other one, because it doesn't have a magnet, is what is causing Oh, yeah. So this, this one here, yeah. I, I'm sorry. It's, that's like I say, I got a little confused because I didn't lay it out. But uh, these here do not have, you're not introducing a magnet to them, but they're working upon themselves. So when you apply voltage to this, this now has lines of force. So this will have lines of force around it. And what's happening is, is when, when the signal goes through it, then it pr creates this magnetic field, and when the signal goes away, the magnetic field dumps in on itself and recreates voltage out so you put voltage into it, but when you let off the voltage, it's recreated going back out. And that's part of the, um, what we call the capacitive uh, inductive reactance, I'm sorry, inducting reactance. So crossovers is, is one place, and uh, here's another, okay. Here's a 70 volt transformer. That's also an inductor. Now transformers are interesting because, and they're drawn this way. So you got one coil here, one coil here. And if this is the source, then this has created a magnetic force out of this side of the coil and on this side of the coil is being cut by those lines of force and moving the voltage on, but they're totally isolated. So you, if you take like a direct box that has a transformer in it, uh, then the reason why they say transformer isolated direct boxes are a really good thing is because you can totally isolate whatever happens circuitry wise on this side here is totally isolated from this side here. Active direct boxes really don't have that advantage. Um, but what active direct boxes have is the ability to, to they're a portable device that doesn't it's not really hooked to anything, you know, if what I'm saying. And so you don't really get that much problem with an with a active direct box um, like you do with, a, but the, tr the transformer, if you want total isolation between the two. And you guys have all heard hum on a system, and then you can use a direct box to get rid of it. Uh, or use the direct box for plugging your guitar into, into a mic input. So uh, the, the difficulty with transformers is that in order to get one that is flat or pre reproduces all frequencies, especially low frequencies, they're really expensive. And so you, you can pick up something like a Rapco direct box, has a very cheap transformer in it. Uh, if you go with a radial direct, direct box, those have Jensen transformers in them, which, which have a much better low-end transfer than, than, the, uh, than the cheap direct boxes. So you want to make sure you look, you look at that when you're using it. I mean, for a lead guitar, I don't know that it makes an awful lot of difference, but it sure does for a bass guitar. Uh, you know, you want to, you want either a direct coupled direct box, which uh, direct coupled doesn't have uh, a lot of the limitations that um, in frequency response that transformers do, but transformers give you better isolation. 
And uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with uh, uh, 70 volt systems, but that's where you can take one output on your amplifier and tie 100 loudspeakers onto it. And because they are, they are, their impedance is being changed by, by way of a transformer. And so there's, there's a, it, there's a whole two hours on, on 70 volt systems. And I'm not sure how many of you guys would really be interested in them anyway, but they operate with transformers. Yeah. Seventy volt system. Yeah, there's seventy volt. They some people call them seventy volt distributed systems. Um, that's that's because you know, I, and I, I can basically tell you, you know, a, a speaker is typically eight ohms. And if you put a transformer in, in front of it, then that raises the impedance up. So 10 watts is 500 ohms. So if your amplifier puts out, um, you know, say 100 watts into 8 ohms, um, then then 10, let's see, it's into eight ohms, if you, if you change that up to 500 ohms, then that's, going to, that's not gonna draw a lot from your amplifier. But the advantage of this is, is if you have eight ohm speakers and you parallel two of them, you've loaded your amplifier down to four ohms. If you have 500 ohm speakers, you can put a, pot load of them on that same channel. Now the channels as we talked about last week are a little bit different uh, in 70 volt amplifiers, but it's basically the same principle. Another place you find uh, coils is in power transformers. There's that one, I mean, well, I shouldn't. It's kind of hard to talk about a lot of these things because they change all the time. But here is a wall wart that is, has got a transformer in it. It's got some weight to it. There are newer wall warts that, are, uh, that don't have transformers in them. They're just feeding directly into it. But this is another place where transformers are used. Um, Here is a coil that is a crossover coil. This one's meant for a subwoofer. And the difference with this one and this one is, is that this one has an air core and this one has an iron core. The iron core allows you to get much bigger values. So this is 0.9 millihenries and this one's 3.5, and so if you're, if you're wanting to limit what's coming out of your subwoofer uh, at a lower frequency, then you need something like this. But you have to be careful with these because they can have so much magnetism in them that the iron saturates. And so uh, people, you don't, we don't like to use iron unless it's absolutely necessary, but if you got a 3.5 millihenry choke that, I mean, um, here's a much bigger one and it's only 1.75. And so can you imagine what a three would be? It's, it's a big, huge roll of copper. And uh, if you're gonna try and put that in a cabinet, number one, it's heavy. Number two is where in the heck are you going to put it? You know, they're just, when they get too big like that, uh, they're just hard to deal with. So that's why they, let, they go down to iron core. Now, it's not, it's not such a bad deal, you know, for like a car stereo or something, uh, uh, even a home hi-fi, but, but you guys are dealing in public address. 
and public address has lots of headroom. And so you, you kind of want to be cautious about using those. But as we discussed last week, uh, most of that is done uh, active anyway, where the subwoofer gets a, a different um, uh, amplifier channel that's crossed over electronically. And, uh, but a speaker like this one has built into it a crossover because there's a low frequency and a horn and, <clears throat> and uh, the, so you can put just one signal into it and get both of them out and that's why it's got the crossover. Yeah. Do you ever, what, what happens when like a like a coil breaks? Do you, do you people just replace them, or do they go through and find where the, the break is in the winding? Or is yeah. That rare? Um, <coughs> most of the time, um, okay. A loudspeaker works completely opposite. So on a loudspeaker, this is also hooked to the diaphragm and also put into the magnet. Uh, but you put this, the amplifier channels right here, and then, the, then that makes the loudspeaker cone move. This can be a loudspeaker. I mean, it, this, is a, this, this unit doesn't work, but if you get a microphone that's a dynamic microphone and you don't want to run it very loud because you'll burn it out, but you can, you can set uh, your amplifier turned down way low across the microphone and listen to it and you can hear it. So they work actually both ways and in um, even speakers like in intercom systems, the speaker acts as both the speaker and a, and a microphone uh, because they will generate voltage and they will also make acoustic power when you put, when you uh, feed the voltage into them. So does that make sense? Excuse me a second. I, I left my water in the back there. Sorry. Now, uh, this inductance thing, um, like I said earlier, can be, um, the coil makes it convenient because the magnet can be concentrated in this thing that they call a gap. And a gap is the area, Let's see if I can draw it here for you. So a, the magnet would be something like this. And then these areas along here are, is the gap. And so the coil would wrap around inside of this gap and not touch the center pole piece or not touch the outside pieces, but it, it's being held in place by the diaphragm. And so it's free to move in, uh, inside the gap. And that's a very efficient way to do it. Uh, when we get talking about loudspeakers, we'll talk a lot more uh, about gaps, but that's a different session than this one. Um, and how things like neodymium have changed the industry completely, you know, in terms of, of uh, weight and, and uh, um, acoustic power output. Um, but the point I was going to get to is that if uh, 
if you have a piece of wire just straight, and I did that again, sorry. And then you lay next to it a, um, a power wire. The power wire has these lines of force that go out from it because it's acting as a transformer. It's not wrapped up and not concentrated in a small thing, but it's putting them out. Well, these things are going over and they're interfering with the mic wire or interfering with the signal line because they're introducing hum into it. Um, used to be a bigger deal than it is now. Um, <clears throat> in my early days, I was doing a, a, a rodeo and uh, had my amplifier set over and the uh, with, with underneath the loudspeakers and the, the mic wire run over and the only place you could get power was in the booth. And so I plugged in power in the booth and then ran the power line and mic line together and it just hummed and I, I couldn't figure out what was causing it, you know, because I hadn't, didn't have any experience, but it turned out that that's what it was. And figure it out. Okay. So we've touched a little bit on that, and we're going we're gonna, to uh, go a little bit more in depth with it, but I want to introduce capacitors right now. Um, a capacitor is, is a very interesting thing. It's probably the most unique um, passive electronic component. And they're drawn, they're drawn this way. You have a plate here and a plate here. And so this, this, one, this, uh, this side over here would be like input to the capacitor and this side would be output from it. Um, these have to be associated with a circuit, however. And uh, I didn't really mean to get into circuit uh, theory at all, but in order for it to work right, you have to understand that it has to be part of a circuit. But what these do is they store energy. And so when you apply, if, if this is like a DC um, power supply and you apply a negative here, then all of the electrons in this go in and they occupy this plate. They push all of the positive parts of the atom out and just have the negative. Um, and at the same time, this one is going positive. See, because this would be your negative side out and this would be your plus side out. And so these, these are all plus. So it's storing it similar to what a battery would do. Uh, they're different than batteries. So if you all of a sudden drop power, then this thing supplies an instantaneous amount of energy uh, to make up for it. Um, the car stereo guys, and I don't know how many of you are car stereo guys, but <clears throat> there is, um, they have they put capacitors in in parallel with their amplifiers in the cars and you'd think why did they do that you know i mean you got this huge battery that's running this amplifier and it's because with when when they when they hit a bass note the amplifier will the, the voltage off the battery will drop well the capacitor knows that that's dropped because it it has it stored and it knows it needs to discharge and fill that in. So you, you do, and I've heard demos on this, and you do really do get better bass if you put a capacitor in there, you know, to, to store the energy. That's not how we use them typically in audio, but that, that is one purpose of them. Uh, another purpose of the storage is that 
you have uh, 60 cycle AC coming into your amplifier and you rectify that down and it doesn't put out a pure DC. So um, boy, I'm really terrible at this. So when the power comes in, and this would be the same way, and this would be, okay, this, this is a typical layout for a rectifier in an amplifier to change AC to DC. And the AC would come in here And then, the, then these would be the DC. But what this puts out is not exactly a DC. It's a pulsating DC. So it looks like this. You recall from last week, you know, sine wave looks like this. And when you rectify it, then you get this and there's always this gap in the middle. So a capacitor, if you put that across, will fill in the gap because it is, it is sensing that something has dropped and it supplies voltage. It's the difference between a capacitor and a battery is the rate of discharge. A battery discharged at a certain rate uh, and it's actually quite slow. Uh, capacitor is an instant discharge device, so it can, it can discharge really rapidly, and so what you end up with on this is a line DC that has been filled in. The, the gaps have been filled in by the, by the capacitor. Any questions on that? That's not how we usually use them. We usually use them in AC. And in AC, um, the, the plate is always changing, so we come in back in and dry, draw our capacitor. Oh, and by the way, what I neglected to tell you is that there's a dielectric here. This is a non-conductor. So if you put a D, if you try to measure a resistance across this capacitor, you won't measure anything because this insulator right here is preventing the DC from going from one to the other. It's only when they charge and then discharge that they're putting out any kind of energy whatsoever. So in AC, if you got your wave that comes in here, part of it during certain portions, it's a positive, and during certain portions, it's a negative. So that capacitor is changing all the time. So it's good. the plate is going from positive to negative, and uh, the other plate is also going from positive to negative, but at a, a delayed time. And well, we, we, we'll, we'll get into that a little later. Uh, and so how this passes through, and you remember that capacitors always have to be part of a circuit. And so if you're feeding this and this goes, this goes negative on this side, then it goes positive here. When it goes negative here, it goes positive here or when it goes positive on this side, it goes negative on this side. When it goes negative on this side, it goes positive on this side. 
And so the capacitor, in a, in a sense, is just passing the signal on through. Does that make sense? Capacitors also have um, what they call capacitive reactants. So they are frequency discriminant. Um, and I'll show you that here in a minute. Well, I'll show it to you right now. So I'm going to play our song again. Okay, I've got the two leads here. Now I'll put the capacitor in. Let me use a, I'll use a little bit bigger capacitor, have you? And that's caused because of, because of a, what they call a capacitive reactance. Now, both coils and capacitors come in all different values, and uh, there's all different types of them. Um, this, this one here is a ceramic capacitor, and that, what that means is that one lead is hooked to one side of the plate and the other's hooked to the other plate and in between the two plates is a piece of ceramic a glass if you will um, this one is these are the most popular right now they use uh, different forms of plastic um, when capacitors first started being built they didn't really have very thin plastic and um, so they would use a lot of things like paper, but paper was very um, environmentally awkward because if it got wet, it, it would conduct, you know, it, and you'd have a shorted capacitor. So they used to do things like coat them with wax, you know, to keep the water out of a capacitor. But, um, but now they use a lot of mylar. Here is a paper capacitor. Actually, this is a better one. These, these that I've shown you here are actually paper capacitors. For some reason, they have more energy to them. Yes, sir? What's changing the capacitance? Is it the material or the distance between the plates? OK, what, what a capacitor is, is it's these two plates with the dielectric in it. And what changes capacitance is the size of the plates. Now, in, in these uh, caps here, they, one of the leads is hooked to each plate, but then the plate is wrapped around over and over again, so it, and the uh, dielectric is in between it, so that such that, you know, these are not shorted out, but you can get a lot of capacitance, lots of plates. Um, in this, this, Size of the plate, uh, not the, how close they are together. Not necessarily the dielectric, because the dielectric, it, its only purpose there in most capacitors is to keep uh, the, the two plates from shorting. But some dielectric is thick, some is, is thinner. Um, so capacitors like a ceramic this wouldn't have very much capacitance. This wouldn't show, this wouldn't store a lot of energy. And if you hook this up to uh, our signal here, you probably wouldn't hear much through it at all because it is such a small value. So where are these good? They're, they're good in things like RF systems, you know, in uh, the, the circuitry that is used in a sure wireless microphone uses 
capacitors that are very similar to this, although they're, they're different now. Here's a different paper capacitor. And even this one, the last one I used was paper. Yes, sir. Sound difference between using ceramic, say, to a paper wrap or something like that, or is it just all based on how much current they have? Yeah. So his question was: Is there a difference between uh, in the sound quality of these different capacitors? And the answer is yes, there is. Um, but obviously, in a ceramic capacitor, you can't roll it up because what's between it is a glass. Okay. So they cannot go very, um, very low in frequency. The, in order to pass a lot of bass, you need a, a very large capacitor to do that. Now, I need to qualify that in the, what we're playing here is, a, is at a very low impedance. And so when you actually get inside the amplifier where the impedances are very high, then you can use smaller capacitors, but that, that's a discussion for a different day. But um, the, and so the answer is, is that there are capacitors for like crossovers that are meant for crossovers and they, yes, are optimized for audio. That's what all of these uh, that I've shown you here are. So, um, maybe I'm not asking, well, maybe I'm not asking a more complicated question. If we have a ceramic one and a coil wrapped up one of, say, the same voltage capacity and the same, you know, designed to do the same thing, yeah. would there be a tone difference or a sound difference from using a ceramic? Throwing out the physics of how size it is. Yeah, yeah, and, and yes, yes, there would be. Uh, <clears throat> papers were have were used in the beginning um, because of their energy. Uh, to give you an idea, I built a electronic ignition for my car one time. This is back before they didn't have them, and it worked by a charging and discharging capacitor. Um, and it said to put a 10 microfarad in there. Capacitors are rated in farads, by the way. Everything in audio is named after somebody somewhere. And so uh, there was this guy named Farad, and uh, a millifarad would be a thousandth of a farad, and even that's too big, so these are in microfarad. So anyway, that called for a 10 microfarad uh, capacitor. I stuck in a 10 microfarad capacitor, and I could not get this thing to work for nothing. But then I went out and found the 10 microfarad paper capacitor, and boy, did it work, because the paper capacitor could pass so much more energy uh, than the other one could, uh, because it had so much more plate surface to it to get the same capacitance. But remember, the plates, um, that what can vary the capacitance is to be closer together or further away. And so, uh, yeah, you, you don't, well, for one thing, you'd never find a paper in a ceramic that would be the same value. The ceramic would have to be huge, you know, and they just don't make them like that. Uh, but for another thing, just be really cautious of it. Uh, when you get into speakers, there's this, there's this capacitor type called electrolytic. Those are actually polarized. <clears throat> and the way they work is that the dielectric is also assisting in, they, they play a little trick. The dielectric is assisting in the, in the charging and discharging. It's not just being a, a dumb thing, you know, a passive thing that's sitting there, it's assisting in it. And um, it's, a, it's a chemical type thing, kind of similar like a battery. So it uses uh, uh, electrolytics are wet inside, but they, because this, if this were a 10 microfarad capacitor and electrolytic, it would be very small 
and then a paper would be very big because the electrolytic has, is cheating by having the dielectric inside help with the tr transfer of electrons. Um, and so that's why it wouldn't have as much energy is because you don't have the plate surface inside of it. Okay. Another type of a uh, capacitor. Oh, how'd that get in there? But in reality, that's a capacitor right there. Capacitors in their early uh, time were um, called condensers. And so now condenser microphones are called, um, a capacitor microphone is called condenser microphone, even though you will have some people who still call them capacitor microphones. And the way they work is that you still have the plate. The two plates, so there is the capacitance between. Um, it, they'll solder a wire onto this coming out this way and they solder a wire coming out this way. <clears throat> and then they go into a little, they will go into a, a little circuit here. And I don't want to get too specific on, on uh, <clears throat> how the circuit works, but this circuit detects change in capacitance. So it's not, it's not trying to pass anything through the capacitor. All it's doing is detecting a change in capacitance. You've got your wire, your mic wire coming in from your console. Uh, so you've got a ground and a minus, and a plus. And on between the ground and the minus and, and plus is what we call phantom power. So when you turn that on, um, on your console, it, what it's doing is sending up 48 volts and Pins two and pins three are equal. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because, as we'll explain here in a minute, you're going to be sending an AC signal down this, and you don't want a potential difference on the two. In fact, <clears throat> it's a very precision thing. They usually will use 1% devices, you know, that vary, don't vary more than 1% uh, to make sure that this one and this one have exactly the same voltage on them. So it's between ground and these two. So what this circuit does is uses part of the phantom power to power the circuit. Obviously it's an active circuit, it needs to. And then it also uh, needs to supply a voltage onto these plates because remember they have to be charged um, and when sound comes down, you know, this is the front of the microphone. Sound is coming into this one. It's changing the capacitance. This circuit here is, is detecting the change, converting it to an AC voltage and sending it down just these two wires here, the, the, the plus and the minus. Um, the ground in, in, in a condenser mic is required to carry the negative part of the phantom power, but we'll see in a dynamic mic, the ground is, does nothing. Uh, so everything on, on your console is between pins two and three. The ground is there for mostly safety, uh, except in condensers where it's, where it's, uh, supplying the negative part of the 
phantom voltage. So this is moving up and down, varying that. It has charges on it. Uh, one one plate's charge positive, one charge plate's negative. And the reason it had the charges is because so that it can detect these minute uh, changes in in the uh, in the movement of the diaphragm, and so uh, that's what's happening. This is this is a it's varying varying the capacitance between here and and putting it out. This is something you can hear. Now, <clears throat> this circuit that we have here uh, has always supplied the voltage for these plates, at least in the early condenser mics. And then there were some guys that got, to, got kind of got together and said, well, you know, there's material that's already charged. Why don't, why don't we put that in there? And then we won't have to supply the charge voltage to that. It's called an electrostatic material, and the microphone that uses that is called an electret condenser microphone. So if you rem if if you want to know what the difference between a standard condenser and an electret is, it's the 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 uh, material that the plates are made of in an electret is already charged, and in a condenser, a standard condenser, it's not. Most of the microphones you find out nowadays are electrets. They're not. There's no reason why not to. Okay. Yes, sir. Your input to the microphone feed there, is that the diaphragm or is the diaphragm feeding something? Because there's a diaphragm inside there. Yeah, this, this is the movable diaphragm right here. Okay. And so the, the sound waves, I'm sorry, I pointed to this, but the sound waves. It's not necessarily a flat metal plate here. It's not necessarily, no. Um, in fact, um, there are certain mylars that are conductive and they use those. In fact, the lower cost mics are that way. Um, if you get one with a metal diaphragm, you're you're at least a thousand bucks. They're they're very very expensive. Um, uh, you know, to have metal diaphragms, so the mylar is a much better way to do it. And they're electrically charging the mylar. Right, and it's already that way. It's already electrically charged in an electret condenser mic. Uh, but you see these all over. I mean, you, you see the ones that have what's what's the number on the big on the large diaphragm electret that you use a lot. Uh, like a KSM forty. Yeah, yeah, KSM, yeah. Yeah, they have they have very very large diaphragms and. The thing about those is, is that for a small amount of signal, there can be more of a capacitance change. And so they're, because they, they have more plate surface, and so they're, they're used a lot for uh, low frequencies or actually, you know, just sonic quality in general. Uh, they can control that. They can, they can change the shape of the diaphragm uh, to, to give it rigidity. Um, on, this, on this one here, I don't know if you can see the ripples in the diaphragm or not. The reason why they do that is is to make it rigid, because if this, if you make a large diaphragm uh, microphone, this this thing could just flop around in there and, and not be very good. But they do the same thing on dynamics. Uh, they they can vary those as well, just by well several factors, not only the shape of the diaphragm and. Uh, but also in the in the magnet structure, they can they can make it so that it uh, performs better at some frequencies and not at others. And if you look at microphones like uh, 
vocal microphones, they all they all have a, they're pretty flat, and then they all have a rise to them. And th this rise here is what gives the, the vocal mic its clarity. And with a condenser, this is easy. They could even use filters over in inside the electronics, but with a with the dynamic, it's a little bit harder. But the Shure SM58, uh, all of them have this rise in it that are used for vocal mics. Um, dynamic, or not dynamic, but omnidirectional mics don't have the rise. These also, uh, the directional mics have also a, what they call a presence peak, which is as you get closer into it, uh, the bass goes up. And uh, so you, you can look at that. I mean, if you hold it out a foot away and then you bring it in, you notice number one, it gets louder, and number two, the bass goes up. And that's, that's built into them by design. Okay. Did you want to take a break for a minute or any questions at this point? Let's take five minutes, go get you a snack and
I'm feeling like time passed me by. That's why I'm sitting on my phone all afternoon. But who am I to even try to make a difference when the world is probably ending so I got a sad new ring to get you all, but all I do is try not to be invisible. But you're in that trying to find the love we never could. I'm looking at it and I'm uncritical, cause when the generation you to make the parents fall. There are the chances, I see that pretty good. Okay, um, Tyler pointed out to me there was something that I forgot to, to tell you, you know, in differences uh, in condenser microphones and, and dynamics. Um, they, they both work pretty well, except that this one has a lot more mass to the diaphragm. In other words, you have not only the diaphragm, but you have a coil hook to it. It's moving the coil within the magnet. The magnet is between the two is also putting up a resistance. And so when they say sensitivity on microphones and how much more sensitive uh, condenser microphones are, it's because of that. It, the, there's no mass because all you're hooked to is that plate and then all that plate's doing is moving in free air and moving closer and further away from the second plate. So uh, we'll look at that a little bit when we look at uh, uh, spec sheets. In fact, uh, we probably should look at spec sheets right now. So this is a specification on an SM58. And <clears throat> What you need to look at mostly is the, okay, 
you see. Well, go down to where it says sensitivity. Um, and this says that if you put a one kilohertz into it, you feed it with one Pascal, and we'll go, in, we'll go into Pascal probably on a different day, but Pascal is just, it's, it's another name, but it's the amount of energy, uh, the pressure that everything is measured by. And so uh, if you put in one Pascal, it puts out minus 56, um, dB and volts, and, and I know we haven't talked about dB yet. I don't know, maybe Aaron did, um, but that's a pretty low number for, uh, and that's, that's because the dynamic just doesn't, that motor isn't that big. In fact, one of the disadvantages of dynamics is that um, you can't have very small microphones because the smaller you go, the smaller the coil, the smaller the motor, the magnet, then the less sensitivity it has and pretty soon you're just way out of range with, with that being able to put out any voltage whatsoever. So with a lot of like uh, the small like clip-on like instrument mics and like lavalier mics, are those dynamic usually too, even though they're kind of like on the smaller side? No, his, his question is uh, about clip-on microphones. Are they're, they're dynamic? And no, they're not. Uh, they're they're typically all condenser microphones. Uh, the smallest dynamic I know of is the SM11, and it's uh, probably five eighths inches in diameter. Um, instead of that putting out minus uh, 56 it would probably put out minus 80 or something like that because it just doesn't have a lot of energy. In contrast, if you go over to, this is the microphone that I showed you. This one puts out nine millivolts per Pascal. The other one puts out 1.6 millivolts per pascal. Yes, sir? Uh, is, the, is that frequency dependent, or is that is Well, the, the, this, is, uh, this is at one kilohertz, and yeah, it would, it would be frequency dependent. Because the other one showed it at a lower frequency. This is showing it at one k. Let's see, we're at 250. The There's probably no difference at that, at that point. You know, I mean, no, the, the, whole, the whole point of this is just to show you that because you have a 48 volt phantom supply, the condenser is capable of putting out a whole lot more and at a lower noise level. Uh, because when you try to amplify these very weak dynamic microphones, um, you have to turn things way up and is not only amplifying the microphone, but also the diaphragm, but also the noise that's coming in on the wire and everything else. Um, can you test uh, with a multimeter the output of the mic, or is this got no spec sheet? Um, I've never done it. Um, you you probably could, but you'd have to get you a test set up saying that you had something that put out the one, put out uh, sound and then a tone, say, and then you would have to extrapolate how the distance over here to make sure that it were one Pascal when it got over to this side. So it's very difficult to do. They do them in laboratories. They don't, they don't do them. So those are the two things on specs that I wanted to show you about. Um, about the mics. Um, what makes a mic directional? Anybody care to gander on that one? Yeah, supporting on the, uh, I guess, yeah. I don't want to say the diaphragm, but on 
that the housing of the bike or the, you know, the grill. Yeah, he's, he says supporting and uh, he's, he's on the right track. What happens on this is uh, if you have a sound source that's right here, um, it is coming in to this diaphragm and, and, and uh, vibrating the, the diaphragm. But if you want to make this a directional microphone, then you open up the gap here so that the sound can also go here. Do you see what I'm saying? So it can hit the front of the diaphragm and the back of the diaphragm. Now what happens if, if, you, if the sound arrives at the same time and you've got it push, one way pushing one and the other one pushing out? Well, it will, 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 will kind of get, it's not exactly phased, but the, the problem is, is if you've got pressure coming down on one thing and an equal pressure coming up, nothing happens. It doesn't move. And so the way a directional microphone works is this talker is here, and he's going straight into it, and he's, he's able to move it here, and then whatever gets comes back around this way, gets canceled out. So the front doesn't get canceled out. So you see what I'm saying? The, you're talking into the mic and you're, you're going straight into it. Uh, this is the shortest path. And then there also has to be a path around this way. Well, the short path, nothing attenuates it, but on the rear path, it makes it Directional. Does that make sense? You see how that works? Now, yeah. What's causing the subtle differences between cardioid and, say, supercardioid? Is that distance it's, or is that it's, just it's, it's the direct, yeah, yeah, the, it's just the, the way that they rate the di directionality. There are a lot of different mics <laughs> out there that, and yeah, they do have different distances and different ways of getting the sound into the back. Um, you've seen, I don't know how many of you have seen the old Electro Voice mics, but they, they had the capsule up here and then they had a long tube and the tube had several slots in it. Um, sound is, Aaron's talked to you about how it is waves, but there are wavelengths. And so the the time that it takes for a low frequency to go is different than the time on a high frequency. So if you've got all of these ports up along and you want to make it directional to a lower frequency, then you put, then you put the ports in and then it picks up each frequency that comes along and cancels it out. And the ultimate is like a shotgun microphone uh, to where they're very directional, but they can cancel out a lot of the, they can cancel out frequencies pretty darn low, uh, you know, because of their length, um, not down to 20 hertz. Uh, 20 hertz, the wavelength is 56 feet. That, that would be a big shotgun microphone if you wanted to cancel down to that. But a thousand hertz is one foot. And so when you talk about these things being directional, they're not directional at all frequencies. You kind of have to look at that. And a lot of manufacturers will, will put out uh, charts on their spec sheets that show you what it does at different, at different frequencies. But, uh, it's a, when, when you go with microphone selection, it's all about the personality of the microphone. You know, some guys suck on to one thing, some guys suck on to the other. And that's more of a topic for air, and I'm just trying to, uh, trying to give you an idea of what makes them directional. And, and so is there any questions on this part of it? I've seen some mic that you can switch the, the directions on them. So is that just oh, like yeah. the closest ports or something? Or? 
Yeah, I think they're doing that electronically. Um, I haven't really looked into that. He, he's asking about the switch that's on some microphones to turn it from a omnidirectional to a figure eight. Uh, uh, I think what's happening is that the pattern of the, the, the airflow back to the back of the diaphragm is the same, but they're switching it up electronically, sensing, I don't know, maybe they have an extra diaphragm in them. I, I haven't really looked into that. But yeah, I think that's what it is. They have an extra diaphragm and they're, they're uh, switching between those electronically. Yeah. Um, any more questions on directional microphones or omnidirectional microphones? Aaron, do you want to talk about for a minute about um, what you use where or Tyler? They're arguing about who's going to do it. Nothing like being put on the spot, I guess. So here we go. Um, did you want me to talk? Okay, there's a lot of theories on all of this, so <laughs> here we go. Okay, here we go. Um, directional microphones, omnidirectional microphones. Um, I get a lot of guys that you know will take an omnidirectional microphone and they want to mic up a choir or something like that with it. And uh, I'll get a lot of studio guys that are like, yeah, the omnidirectional, you want to use this because it sounds great. And that might be great for uh, the, the studio where there's no live reinforcement, but then all of a sudden we put it in a live environment and I don't want that because it's going to pick up the PA and there are all the reflections of the room and stuff like that. So there's one uh, use case scenario. Uh, directional microphones, especially uh, if I just want to be able to isolate, you know, what's going on around the environment, make sure I get just what's in front of it. You know, there's a lot of different um, caveats or compromises that you've got to really take into consideration because you know that um, a lot of guys do like those omnidirectionals because they're more of a flat frequency response but then all of a sudden you do a directional one and like Deward said depending on frequency is how they're going to respond and sound so as we change the pattern it's going to change how the microphone hears so you if you want to really filter out what's going on out around the microphone um, it's going to change how you deal with it in the mix. Uh, so another thing um, that's really fun. Oh, uh, also really pay attention to your frequent your pickup patterns because there's a lot of times if a performer you know this is kind of going by the wayside, but if you've got dual monitor wedges and you have a super cardioid mic with a lobe out the back, that might be really good to put your wedges coming into the, the dead zone on the back side of your super cardioid. Whereas if it's a single wedge, you might want to go with just the cardioid because there's the dead zone in the back side of the microphone. So really when we start looking at all the construction, the frequency response, the polar patterns, you know, it, it's really start taking a look at what exactly is the goal that you want and then choose the appropriate microphone for what you're going in for. So you can't just say like, oh, a, a condenser and omnidirectional is gonna be always good for this environment or this application because it just is not gonna go that way for you. So it's really knowing and becoming the ultimate audio nerd and memorizing all the specs of all the mics that you might wanna use. Um, and you want you, you want to weigh in on this? C come on up. <laughs> I'm learning a lot from Dewar here today, and I've had some use case scenarios I can talk about for a second. You know, 
Yep. So just a couple notes I've had after learning this today, um, or learning more, broadening my knowledge. Um, as Deward mentioned, these, an SM58, this dynamic diaphragm takes a lot of energy, a lot of sound pressure, a lot of air movement to make this diaphragm move. Not only does it take a lot of energy for that, it then may have to send that energy down a long wire through a split, who knows, you might go through like four or 500 feet of copper to get to the preamp in your console. And what a preamp does is it's taking these tiny amounts of voltage. You saw when he took his magnet on this coil here, the scope only moved a little bit. So we're talking tiny, tiny amounts of voltage that we're gonna send down a 500 foot wire. And then we gotta amplify that to a voltage that'll work throughout the console. And then we'll pass that onto our big power amplifiers that we learned about and it'll come out the speakers which in turn have lots of energy and they're moving a lot of air so that we hear it. When we're trying to amplify such a small voltage, you'll notice on like an SM57 at a press conference or something, you gotta turn your head amp up to like plus 50 dB on your console, right? You gotta really give that thing some umph. And what you're doing is you're amplifying a lot of noise too. With a condenser microphone, Deward mentioned we have this this advantageous um, circuit here, which means we've got 48 volts of DC, and so we can actually send a higher voltage down that 500 feet of cable so that our preamp on the console is able to just barely be cracked open because we're actually doing a preamplifier stage right at the source, right at the microphone. We're taking these small amounts of pressure right, at, right inside this capsule on a condenser and, and ramping that voltage right up to where our head amp can be low, so now our signal to noise ratio is lower, right? We're, we're not amplifying noise in a cable because we amplified it in a very short circuit right here. Um, the downside to that can be gain before feedback, right? So um, th that's kind of my two cents is be thinking about the use cases where if you have an instrument that has a lot of dynamic range, let's say a harp, but really doesn't put out much volume, you know, you walk 10 feet away from a harp and you can hardly hear him playing half the time. Great use case for a condenser. Um, something like a vocal. I probably, I tend to lean towards dynamic on that most of the time unless the vocal is the true, uh, is, is something really important, but like, I mean, the vocal is important, but like, if you have a vocal with a lot of other stuff going on, I try to go dynamic because you've got a lot of sound pressure between you and that element and then all these other like the drum kit and the uh, organ over there or the violins over here aren't going to bleed into it because the, by the time their energy gets to it it's it's going to be so far below on the energy spectrum compared to that vocal that's right that mouth that's right in front of it putting out a lot of pressure so that's kind of my two cents is take this and you can apply it to remember your 500 feet of cable and stuff I don't know. That's my thoughts, Stuart. Do we want to talk about resistors or keep talking about mics? Yeah. All right. But I do want to make sure that everyone is has no questions. But there was a question came up uh, during the break about tube uh, microphones and. <clears throat> Tubes are kind of an interesting animal uh, in respect that there's no conductivity between the plate that takes where the microphone will modulate and the, to the plate uh, where, where, is, where the output is. Uh, they call it a grid. I don't. I'm searching back to tube days, but um, there's no conducti conductivity between DC conductivity between that grid and the output. Consequently, they are very, very high impedance inputs, and for some types of capsules, some types of circuits, um, there it that is a very good attribute. 
because if you take a a console like a like a Yamaha console, uh, we noted that that this like the SM58 spec uh, said that its output impedance was 300 ohms. Um, the input of the console is 2,000 ohms, but the input of a tube is infinite. So some microphones don't like to be loaded. They don't like to see the same impedance as their output as the impedance on the input. And they figure that uh, between 300 and 2,000 ohms is pretty sufficient for most things, and so you don't get it. But we've had situations, how many times have you tried to parallel mics, two mics into one input? You're shooting yourself in the foot because what you're doing, if they're 300 ohm microphones, instead of that 300 ohm microphone looking at a 2,000 ohm input, it's looking at a 300 ohm load and it's changing the response of the mic. And so the tubes is just another way to give a lot of flexibility on the microphone, on what, what it does. Plus, some guys are hooked to some, one side of their brain, other guys are hooked to the other side of the brain. Some guys will tell you that there's nothing like a tube tube amplifier. Um, when I bought my turntable, I bought a tube preamp and I won't go back. I like it. I mean, it's really, it really does, is a nice sound to it. It's nice, warm, and it's, it's, you know, solid state sometimes sounds kind of grainy to me, but um, there's a lot to that, you know, and, and I think the reason why tube microphones are so as they are is because uh, because of that fact how you know we talked yet last week about these devices always recreating the sound and they don't recreate it all equally and so uh, a lot of people just like the way the tubes do it so what other questions do you have about mics We were going to go into uh, DB today, but there is just not time. Uh, DB is uh, something that we use all the time, and I've just, uh, there's so many people misunderstand it, and I just don't want you guys to be part of that group that doesn't understand it. So we, we need to do it more at a time we have, when we have time. So. What we would like, what I'd like to do is just open it up and whatever questions you have about uh, miking, wire, hookup, any of that type of thing. Um, if you do, if, if not, we're, we can dismiss a little early. What about resistors? Oh, resistors, okay. So we played, we played our signal um, We played our signal through a capacitor, and you heard that it cut all the low end. And this is something else I can talk about in this too. And you heard the, when we put the choke, it took away all the high end. A resistor is just, a, just resistance. All it is is it doesn't distinguish anything with frequency, so I can hook uh, Just lowered the level. You hear all the highs, you hear all the lows, just lowered the level. Um, 
The boss wanna know what's going on, so Joseph and Mary hit the road. With Mary and I on nine months gone, ain't no way. Resistors are more used in circuitry. You do find them sometimes uh, uh, in, you know, externally, but there's, there's not a lot to them. They're just, some of them are made of carbon, some of them are wire wound, you know, because wire has resistance in it, carbon has resistance in it. Um, by the way, on, on microphones, um, dynamic and condenser aren't the only two out there. They're, but they're the two most prominent. Um, yeah, I don't know if how many of you have looked at a really old telephone set, but those use a carbon microphone. And what a carbon microphone is, is um, it's taking the signal, di rotating the diaphragm and varying resistance. So they have a circuit that where the varying resistance is what's producing the sound instead of the very capacitance. And so, because they're feeding a voltage into it, uh, the, carbon, the carbon granules inside are changing resistance and changing the voltage out and it will actually reproduce it. Terrible sounding devices. They're, they don't go very high in frequency. Um, another type of microphone that was very popular High school was um, uh, uh, crystal microphones, and turns out that there is a there's a type of material out there. It's called a crystal, and if you hook a wire to one side of it, and then you poke a wire into the other side of it, when you move this wire around that you've poked into it, it'll produce a voltage. And so they hook a diaphragm to the wire that you poked into it, and that's moving in and out and producing a voltage out that goes out. Um, again, those had issues with them, temperature and uh, all, all kinds of issues. So you never see ceramic microphones anymore. What you see is uh, condensers. Okay, ribbons, yeah. So. Um, they were very popular. They were very popular back in the, uh, well, in the 60s, say. Um, the <clears throat> LDS church used to use ribbon microphones on their podium. And um, every once in a while, you'd get a call saying it's not working. You'd go out there, and the ribbon was just totally fused in half is because somebody had walked on the carpet, static electricity touched it and burned the ribbon out like a fuse, you know, but, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I was thinking about this earlier when you were talking about the wire. There are certain cables out there that are listed as in, in, in our own, just like we're talking the video line is usually 75 ohms and the RFs are 50 or ohms on back back. But I, I can't figure out what, what they're measuring to come up with these ohmage ratings. Is this per 1,000 feet or per 500 feet or what is Because there's also capacitance in there as well. well what's it, changing the, 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 the what's, what's changing in the wire or the copper or whatever? Is it like this one a 75 ohm and this one a 50 ohm or whatever you want to do? Well, strangely enough, it's capacitance and inductance, but... What the, when they rate those, they always stipulate a, stipulate a frequency with it. Um, when I was working younger as a technician, about the highest we would go on a TV distribution system was 100 megahertz. Now, you don't see anybody installing anything under a gigahertz. And uh, it's because wire and everything else has come along, but and a piece of coaxial wire and, uh, and, a, and then a wire going up the middle, there is capacitance over distance between that center wire and the shield. <clears throat> that capacitance, just like this, is, is only on, on this one we had it in series, but it's like shorting the signal out to ground. 
and so it's limiting high frequencies. Well, if you're asking about um, how you tell between a 50 ohm cable and a, and a 75 ohm cable, you you look at it because there's when there's no difference. You just have to look at the rating on it. Uh, in fact, in some things and some wireless, if, if you don't have 50 ohm cable, all you have is 75 ohm cable, then you can substitute it. I no, that's no just problem. one of the things I've run into where it's like we're yeah. talking from like line cable to say the AES rating cable. Uh, what would you use to measure that ohmic difference? Or, or if, if you, a, I don't know how they do it. Okay. He's asking, how do you measure that? Um, and you know, and I know a AES has is rated in ohms, and, and you know the same as same as the 75 and 50 ohm cables. But how they actually come up with that? If you look at AES wire and you look at all of the other specifications on it, it has a very low capacitance. Um, mic wire, um, like West Pen 452 is um, 45 point, I can't remember, 0.45 something. Um, I don't, it's, anyway, it's, it's, the capacitance is actually quite high. If you go with 454 wire, that cuts down to, to 34. And what that's saying is, is that's the capacitance in the wire. So if you, <clears throat> you can go a lot further distance with the lower capacity wire without losing your high frequencies. Now, if you guys are working with mic cords that are 50 feet or 75 feet, you don't have to worry about it. But say you go into a convention center and they ran the mic wire 1,000 feet from there to the rack, that's where you'd start to be concerned about it. And so most of those types of jobs, um, the, the wire is specified to be a lower capacitance wire. And so that's one of the things in AES wire that's that way because uh, digital is not an analog signal. It is a bunch of on and offs. And it has high transient. And any type of capacitance can screw it up really bad because it, it, it acts like a very high frequency. And so in, in AES wire, which is just digital, that capacitance has to be low. But I don't know how, how they, where they come up with the different ohm rating on it. I'll have to research that. Um, so. That's the way it is in category cable. Yeah, I don't know if that's true. I'm just trying to figure out how to yeah. figure out what I want the wire to do. If we yeah. have it sitting here. Yeah. I, that's what I was told. Whether or not that's true or not, I have no idea. But. Yeah. It makes sense because that's the way category cable is. Um, I, there's one thing I can show you here. That, We already looked at the fact that a, a, speak, a speaker has, we've got our speaker over here. This would be our woofer. I'm not a very good artist. This would be our horn. If you want to limit low frequencies into the horn, then you would put a capacitor in. And if you want to limit high frequencies into the woofer, then you put a coil in. And you all heard how that helps. Now, um, actually, this is wrong. Um, 
And so you've got your, you also have your ground that comes to both speakers. What did you say, the coil takes out the high frequency? Coil takes out the high frequency, capacitor takes out the low. What this would be would be what they call a first order filter. Uh, it's very predictable that the capacitor will, once you pick the spot, and the pick the spot requires the impedance of the driver and the capacitance value. And so say you want to, um, say, say you want to cross over at uh, 800 hertz, um, you'd, you'd have a value of a, you know, a 5.6 microfarad into a, into the 8 ohm driver uh, would give you 800 hertz, but this 800 hertz would be at 6 dB per octave, very gradual. And then on the coil, if you pick it for 800 hertz, it would be very gradual uh, at 6 dB per octave. If you want to make this 12 dB per octave, what you would do is take and put a coil here, and so you're passing the high frequencies through to the driver, and then you're having a coil that takes the high frequencies back and shorts them to ground. So all of a sudden, on your you're at 12 dB per octave, so your slope looks like this. The same thing on this one. You want to make this 12 dB per octave, you put a capacitor here. And so on and so forth. Um, I've seen filters up to 48 dB per octave. And all of that does is you put another capacitor here and another coil here, and then you just keep going. Um, so this is 24 dB per octave right here, and then you double that in order to get 48 dB per octave. Yeah? Would you be able to talk about uh, how changing the, the slopes affects the uh, phase response? The phase response? Phase... Um, <clears throat> Number one thing to remember is it's always frequency dependent, okay? And with all of these filters comes a phase response. Um, in fact, if you've ever heard the, the term Linkwitz-Riley filter, um, Linkwitz-Riley is looking at that phase and trying to match it up between uh, low frequency and high frequency. So uh, I wish I had my notes with me to uh, show you what this, what this was, but I don't have them. But um, with this being first dB per octave, six dB per octave, it has a phase curve that's associated with that. 12 has a phase curve that's associated with it, so on and so forth, you know. Um, there's some guys, there was a company called Fender that uh, put out third, third order filters. That's where you wouldn't have this coil here. You'd have two capacitors in one coil. And they, they took that, phase change that that filter made, and I, I promise you I'll, on a future class, I'll get these notes and, and show you what all of these phase curves are. In fact, uh, I can measure them and show you exactly, you know, on the measurement what they are. But, um, but the fender would take that, and it turned out that, that it's going to be better if we reverse the polarity on the high end on a third order filter. Um, on a first order filter, you don't want to do that. On a second, you don't, but on a third, you can, you know. Uh, and you, you actually see some speakers that 
change that, change the polarity. So phase is frequency dependent, polarity is not. Uh, if you're putting out a positive at uh, 500 hertz um, and then you turn, you change the phase, then that's a negative at 500 hertz. And so the phase cancellation that's within these, uh, it's really hard to predict. And it's not hard to predict electronically, and that's what I'll show you, but it's hard to predict what you'll come up with because this. This has a woofer where the back of it is right here, but the back of the horn is clear up here. So there's a difference in the time, the time that it takes the woofer to get out versus the, the horn to get out. So I can't answer your question today exactly, but uh, if we do a, a, a class on uh, filtering and networks and, uh, you know, Phase is, is really, really important. Uh, people don't realize it. I mean, they, you listen to the amplitude of a speaker and all the attention's put towards the frequency response, the amplitude, but you look at the same speaker and it has a lousy phase response, it, it, it really does make a big difference. And what they're really talking about are time differences uh, between, between two parts of the signal. And that's what phase really is, at the same frequency, a time difference. Um, so, I don't know, just not prepared to do that today, but it's a very important topic. I've, I've uh, been involved in, in uh, teaching phase two, and so I've got a lot of notes on it. So, sorry. Any other questions? Okay, well, um, yeah, you done? Okay. How do we do time wise? About 10 minutes early. Appreciate your coming. And wh what, what do you got on tap next, Aaron? What do you have you decided what you're going to do it on? Not yet, not yet. Uh, you know, there's a number of ones I'm thinking about, such as like uh, fixing all the setup that practices microphone technique. Um, okay. Yeah, I just don't, I just didn't, you know, I, I didn't want to leave these guys in a lurch. And if, uh, if, if you're going to do one on phase and this type of thing, then we'll. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very misunderstood subject. It's a very um, kind of difficult one to grasp because there's no ah, uh, you know, there's no aha moment in phase. You got to learn every part of it. You know, there's there's nothing intuitive about it. Put it that way. But.